Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Richard Eidlin with Business for America. Thanks so much for joining us today on the conservative case for vote by mail and election security. And Business for America is a national nonpartisan uh, not-for-profit uh, based in California with offices throughout the United States. And our job is to engage and mobilize businesses across the country to work on nonpartisan political reform and election security issues. And uh, the goal of that is to help strengthen our representative democracy. Over the number of past number of months, we've been working actively on a number of election related issues, including the vote by mail issue or the absentee balloting issue. Uh, same thing, but means different things to different people as we'll discuss today. And um, we wanted this morning uh, to have a, a conversation with you all on the phone and with our panelists <clears throat> about the debate within conservative circles about vote by mail. And I'm sure as you've all been tracking, there are a number of statements <clears throat> that have been made by President Trump over the past number of months suggesting that vote by mail is uh, full of fraud and uh, not a secure or trustworthy system. And so we wanted to hear from uh, our panelists this morning about why that uh, is not the case and why vote by mail is actually uh, not designed to advantage one political party or, an, or another. And we do really want this to be a, a conversation. Um, and Again, you know, our primary audience at Business for America are businesses, small, mid, large companies. We have been organizing a campaign over the past two months to encourage Congress to allocate $3.6 billion worth of funding that would go to states that would help those states and localities within to uh, run a safe, secure, and credible election. So again, today we wanted to dig into why conservatives across the country, many conservatives think that uh, this is an important initiative and will help to uh, drive turnout and help to stabilize our democracy. So um, let me turn the mic over uh, to uh, Business for America's founder, Sarah Bonk, and uh, Bonk wanted to offer some comments and then we'll get going with the rest of the program. Thank you, Richard. Thank you to our panelists and our co-hosts, and thanks to everyone who's joining us online. So I founded Business for America with this idea that the interests of the public and the interests of the business community are aligned on having a well-functioning representative democracy, a republic if you prefer to call it that, and that hyper-partisanship and polarization are hurting all of our interests. Um, as Richard mentioned, we're a national nonpartisan nonprofit, but you could think of us as a, a bit, another business organization, but with an exclusive focus on strengthening our democracy by boosting voter participation, ensuring election integrity, and reducing political polarization. So when I bring this up, people often ask why business even cares about democracy. And I can tell you there's a lot of reasons, but we've boiled it down to a couple simple ways to, to categorize it. First, um, as I've alluded to, our dysfunctional government is failing to solve a lot of problems. It is hurting our interests. Uh, we see it damaging our economy, hindering competitiveness, and therefore it's harming our businesses. Um, in this way, uh, the business community has an enlightened self-interest in the health of democracy. And second category is uh, really that sort of corporate social responsibility category because we do care about our employees. We care about our customers. We care about the communities where we operate. And we want everyone to have, who has the right to be heard to be heard. Um, a lot of us feel we have this responsibility, really a duty to help preserve democracy in this country because this is where we founded our businesses. It's why we were able to thrive. And uh, therefore we have a, an obligation to give back. So that brings us to the reason for the conversation today as we meet with business leaders across the country, we hear over and over about how polarization, partisanship, and gridlock are hurting the country. But a large part, people don't know what to do about it exactly. And what's amazing is that aside from a few wedge issues, Americans from across the political spectrum have a lot of agreement on so many issues, but you would never know it from listening to politicians or reading the news. So 
one of those issues is expanding vote by mail. Um, when you read the polls, we can see like so many people want to get this done and ensure people can vote safely. So we hope to wrangle enough bipartisan support to get the funding necessary for states to avoid the calamities we've seen during the Wisconsin primary, the Georgia primary, and other primaries that just have not gone as smoothly as really we deserve, as American voters deserve to, to see. Um, businesses want to be sure everyone with the right to vote is able to do so in a way that is safe and secure and accessible regardless of their politics. And we want to have an election in which Americans can have real confidence in the outcome, regardless of who wins. And yes, you know, we can have elections that are both secure and accessible. The business community knows that there's absolutely no reason to sacrifice one for the other. It's 2020, as I like to say, we have the technology, we have the know-how. The only thing stopping us from getting this done is the political will. So as you, all, you know, all, all of you probably have heard, um, political change is much more likely to happen when the business community gets involved and there's so much business can do to help here. Today, Business for America is asking businesses to help ensure that voting in the 2020 election is safe and the results are accurate and everyone can participate, everyone who has the right to participate can participate um, without too much uh, difficulty. So we're asking businesses to sign our nonpartisan business letter to the United States Congress in support of funding for vote by mail that the states need. You can read our letter and sign it at bfa.us. Um, and we're happy to answer questions too if you, um, if you want to know more before you sign. Um, and with that, I um, think I'll hand it back to you, Richard. Great, good, thank you. So uh, there were a number of organizations that helped to promote um, this webinar today. And uh, one of those was Fix the System. And I wanted to introduce uh, <clears throat> Nilmini Rubin from Fix the System. And Nilmini, I was looking at um, a description of Fix the System online the other day. And it said to put more conservative and corporate muscle into the issue um, or the goal of trying to reduce polarization and solve some of the big problems that the United States is facing. So tell us just briefly, if you would, about Fix the System. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm Nomi Rubin. I'm the managing director of Fix the System, which is a coalition of cross-partisan organizations working together to, to strengthen democracy. So it includes um, Mindy's organization, Stand Up Republic, um, Issue One, Leadership Now, uh, Represent Us, Unite America, um, a bunch of other really great organizations that are, are kind of amplifying each other's voices on, on these issues. Um, I, I did want to echo what, what Sarah was saying, um, that, you know, there is a unity around vote by mail, um, despite what you're hearing from DC. Like, so the, there's a real disconnect between what's happening here in DC. I'm, I live right on the outskirts of DC and what we're hearing from people in the, the rest of the country. And um, I think as conservatives, we believe we can win based on our good ideas and our good candidates. And we, we, we don't need to, to fix or change a vote by mail in a way that would, would unilaterally benefit our candidates. I also wanted to kind of just add this idea that, that the history of absentee voting in the United States is really the history of major wars. Um, you know, it started in the American Revolution in 1775, people cast proxy votes. You know, it happened uh, during the Civil War. Um, Lincoln and the Republicans pushed for, for vote by mail and uh, over 150,000 soldiers voted in the, the 1864 election. Same in World War II, soldiers increased their votes and today you know, thousands of soldiers are voting by mail. And that idea that the history of absolute voting is a history of wars, I think fits with the moment that we're in. We're in a war and it's a war against COVID and we need to keep people safe and secure. We need to keep our elections safe and secure. And uh, for, for members of Fix the System, and we, we strongly believe that increasing absentee voting and vo voting by mail is an important part of securing this upcoming November election and future elections. Great, good. <clears throat> Nilmini, thank you so much for that. Um, John, um, John Pudner is another one of our co-hosts this morning from Take Back um, Our Republic. And John, um, just wanted to ask you to briefly introduce yourself and um, tell us about the, the work you're doing, the, 
with, around conservative solutions for uh, good government, for campaign finance reform, and why vote by mail is an important issue for your organization. Well, thank you. It's uh, almost felt like our only issue the last couple of weeks. Uh, that's been all the attention. Um, you know, we, we've really taken the case. I mean, I've been on Breitbart Radio, everywhere from there to you know, being quoted like everyone is in the New York Times and across the spectrum. And, um, you know, we've tried to make a real distinction, which is a little more nuanced on vote by mail. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of people just say, well, a lot of people who, you know, want to be President Trump also say we want vote by mail, therefore it's bad. Um, you know, just, that's the way things are now with everything's at a fever pitch. And we try to make a distinction, actually say, look, there, there are some valid concerns with security like there are in any system. Um, you know, we, we, for example, draw the line that we actually don't want ballots being mailed to everyone. I've just watched flushing efforts on the ground and, and um, you know, the, the idea of millions of ballots themselves actually all hitting at once um, and sort of being thrown away or everyone knowing the day they're in the mailboxes, you know, that's ripe for you know, a small percentage of people out there who are active trying to get votes out to be fraudulent. You know, it's just, so, so we've tried to draw a line right there, but say we'd go as far as mailing applications in a pandemic that um, you've got to make this more accessible. And another thing we try to do because we're a little more conservative, um, credentialed with the kind of Trump supporters is um, I think we've been able to make a distinction in some of these tougher audiences on this because it's become so polarized since his tweets um, and say, uh, look, if, if, if you don't use mail-in, <laughs> you're killing yourself. I mean, we've, I've talked to Republican chairs throughout North Carolina and Pennsylvania who said they're going from place to place just as part of a turnout operation. This isn't anything altruistic. This is just everyone get your votes in. We don't know how bad COVID's going to be in the fall. Um, you know, go ahead and vote now. Who knows how bad it'll be? And the reaction, they're almost getting shouted down at these local Republican meetings saying, no, the president said this is fraudulent. I'm not mailing my ballot in. Like, it sounds like my vote may be stolen. So even on the face, if you take, you know, the, uh, you take the charge itself, it, it's so misinterpreted, like a lot of things, when it's just a tweet, or it's just something small, and they suddenly think, well, my vote may not count if I'm mailing it in, not, hey, there's this concern about if you put a bunch of ballots on the street, or what are the lines there, how do you make sure it's the person you say it is, so, right. so even from a practical perspective, um, yeah, there's a reason 29% of the ballot applications in Pennsylvania are Republican, <laughs> even though the party there does an incredible job of mailing out and asking people to vote mail in, this contradictory message, so, you know, it's just going to hurt the, you know, the senior vote and all kinds of other things. If, if, if things are bad in October on the pandemic front, a right. lot of people are not going to vote, and that's why we got to push for mail in. Okay. Good, good, good. John, thank you, and thank you, Nilmany. Uh, and we're going to return to those themes that uh, both uh, articulated. So let me turn, Bill, to you. So um, Bill Crystal is the uh, founder of the Weekly Standard, has been very involved in a number of new organizations defending democracy together, Republicans for the Rule of Law. And Bill, you have been quite active in this issue over the past several months. And I wonder if you could school us a little bit on sort of the bigger picture of conservative principles around uh, voter enfranchisement and participation in our representative democracy. And why would conservatives want to support uh, making it easy to vote and, and hard to cheat, maybe something that, you know, that a number of you have, have been thinking about. But uh, what is the conservative case, Bill, from sort of a, you know, maybe his, a brief historic perspective and a current perspective um, uh, of why conservatives should get behind this idea of voting by mail? I mean, mostly because it's the right thing and because it's an American case, not a conservative case. I'm not really even that interested, honestly, in making some argument about how, oh, Republicans, you're hurting yourself, or conservatives should be for this. It's totally outrageous in the middle of a pandemic to make it difficult for people to vote safely. And you can totally bracket the broader debate about whether states uh, should have vote by mail entirely or partly, and how many days they should have for absentee voting and early voting. And just say those are legitimate debates in states. I live in Kim runs a vote by mail system in 
Washington that's extremely effective. And I don't even think has the problem that John mentioned about mailing ballots out, but whatever. I live in Virginia, which has much more been much more restrictive typically on vote by mail and absentee voting. I usually vote absentee in person, uh, so I'm not a big vote by mailer. But obviously, in the current situation, with what we know, what we saw happen in Wisconsin and Georgia, and with what are reasonable expectations or worries, at least, about the pandemic, it's just irresponsible not to make it easier for people to vote safely and securely. So I think the, on the merits, the argument is easy. The fraud argument is phony. Uh, and we saw what happened in Georgia Tuesday night. And I think businesses, it's nice to be bipartisan and nice to everyone, and respectful. Businesses in Georgia need to say that it's a total, and there are many large businesses headquartered in Georgia last I looked in Atlanta and elsewhere. Right. It's a total disgrace what's happening there. And they need to weigh in in a serious way and not in a, oh, I just want to respectfully suggest that you guys should do something. They need to say that it is, you know, they will condition their various not political donations and maybe other civic participation in being headquartered in a state that can have a safe and secure election. So I'm, I've gotten pretty militant on this in the sense that I think the business community should get pretty militant on it. And it's not just a matter of, you know, we want to be good citizens and we're kind of adding our name to a lot of other good citizens. They have a real corporate responsibility at the state level. In some states, in other states, there's not a huge problem and they can be more relaxed, I suppose. And then at the federal level, uh, the problem is the Republicans in the Senate who have been resistant so far. And some of them know better and some of them could be pushed to know better. And they need to be pushed, frankly. And there are many businesses in Missouri who can deal with Senator Blunt and businesses in Georgia that can deal with the Republican senators from there. I mean, I am not, if the Democrats were a problem, I'd be, I'd be for pushing them. They just aren't right now really, honestly, a problem. So you can be bipartisan, but in the real world, the pressure needs to be against Republicans. The one, I'll finally say, the one like slight caveat to that is, I mean, you can imagine a situation in a month where the Democrats are insisting on some provisions which are in the Democratic bill for the past the House that really aren't probably necessary and that probably should be bargained away at the end to, you know, just get the money to the states. Um, and there, it might be useful for some business leaders to be calling some Democrats and say, hey, you've got a pretty good deal on the table. Uh, let's, let's accept it. I can see that happening a month from now. I think the speaker is inclined to accept it, honestly. But, but anyway, that's, that's a problem for then. The problem for now is not a bipartisan problem. It's a partisan problem and businesses need to be serious about it. But I come back to the state level too. I mean, it really, Wisconsin, in fact, has basically fixed its system from when the election happened, I think, or at least in the process of doing so. Um, and Georgia, let's see if Georgia does. But I really, you know, honestly, I don't know, I, I assume you have CEOs from companies from Georgia that are on this call and stuff, but they really need to be, that, that, that's their state. And that's on them if this election looks in November. And it will be a disaster, final point. I really will make this a final point. It won't just be whether it hurts Republicans or Democrats or you know, depresses turnout, which obviously is bad. Uh, you can have a genuine crisis of democratic legitimacy if you have a situation like you had in Georgia. People will not believe the results are fair. Uh, if, there's, if, if, you know, if there's controversy about if some judge orders the polls to be held open late in certain parts of the state because there hasn't been enough polls and there wasn't enough absentee and early in uh, voting and vote voting by mail. And then the other side, in this case, the Republicans will say, well, those votes shouldn't be counted. And you know, you really could have a genuine crisis in the country on November 3rd, 4th, 5th, and, and, and mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. uh, different electors being sent. There are a lot of nightmare scenarios. The best way to avoid them is to have a pretty incontestably uh, clear and clean election in which everyone who wants to vote can vote however they wish to vote and however their state laws permit them to vote, but with enough uh, range and enough funding that they can vote. And then at least we avoid, who knows what the result will be, but I think we avoid a genuine crisis in November. Mm -hmm. but, but Bill, thank you. And what are you finding are some compelling arguments to make to Republican senators on these, on these themes? So do you talk about the competition, competition marketplace of ideas, um, you know, the benefits of wide-scale participation by the public, uh, the effort to maintain trust and legitimacy. What, what are you finding carries the day? 
I mean, the truth is they most of them know better. Cory Gardner is the Republican senator from Colorado. He was elected in a vote by mail election. He doesn't need to be persuaded that, you know, and in fact, the Colorado Republican Party, the Florida Republican Party, I think uh, John mentioned North Carolina, these parties have actually done quite a lot of work on voting by mail and absentee voting. They're not idiots. You know, they've, once their states have more of that, they know how to get in touch with people and so forth. Um, so, you know, the I don't know how much of it. So I, so I, a lot of this is just intimidation because the president's decided it's, he doesn't like it. And the president's political advisors, I think genuinely think they would benefit, they will benefit somewhat from an election where it's harder for some people to vote and the people for whom it will be harder to vote in a confusing and dangerous situation are probably more urban voters who they think won't help them. I mean, that's their, their political calculation. Let's not kid ourselves that they're, they're being, so in a way, you know, I don't know how much their arguments matter. I would say, having said all that, for the people who are in good faith being a little misled, I think A, that it's not fraudulent, certainly that it's no more fraudulent, there's no more opportunity for corrupt fraud than there is in other forms. I mean, it's unbelievable, you know, we have a long history of election fraud in the US actually, and some of it's quite colorful and famous. Uh, Illinois in 1960, LBJ didn't he win his first election with some, you know, like ballot box that was discovered with 1,012 votes, all of which were for him and some obscure county in Texas or something. Those are vote, not vote by mail frauds. Those are ballot box stuffing frauds and uh, and so forth. So I think, but, but, but answering that objection in good faith is important, I think, for those who, who are, have been sort of persuaded and lulled by it. And I do think, as, as I think someone said earlier, the, the fact that, um, uh, that our military in particular is always voted by mail in, in, in wartime, but now, I mean, not just the, and the military still does, incidentally, um, but uh, our son voted by mail from Afghanistan in 2010. But I mean, leaving aside all the dramatic pictures of people filling out forms, you know, at the side of tanks and so forth, millions of Americans vote by mail. I mean, was the, wasn't a quarter of the electorate in 2016, I think, voted by mail. I don't know if that includes, uh, that includes some absentee. And then a lot of others probably voted early absentee, so, um, or early voting. So the notion that this is some exotic thing needs to be combated and that this is very much in the American tradition of we want people to vote in, in, uh, in uh, safe and secure elections. And, and finally, I think one can also say, look, Virginia state legislature can debate in 2021 how much they want, what kinds of rules they want to have on voter ID and early voting. And as I say, we've been a somewhat restrictive state typically, Washington and others have been much more sort of the easy, wide open, or, however you want to say, you know, uh, friendly to, to, to not to election day in-person voting being the only way to vote um, or the main way to vote. But that's a debate that we can, the legislation now is for 2020. It's not, it doesn't change states' rules going forward. I think that's a pretty good talking point for the, uh, and I think clarifying that is important. That is, I think one of the more effective Republican talking points has been the federal government's telling us how to run our elections. That's really not true. The federal government's providing money to help states adjust to the, to the particular circumstances we face with the pandemic in 2020. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and let me pick up on this um, suggestion that the federal, that uh, Congress is federalizing the election and Kim, go, go to you. Uh, Kim Wyman is the Secretary of State in Washington State. And, um, Kim, thank you for joining us. And you know, we've had a number of conversations about the nonpartisan nature of voting by mail. And Washington is one of five states in the country um, that has uh, everybody voting by mail, just as in, in Colorado and Hawaii and Oregon. And, um, and I'm forgetting the fifth state. Utah. Utah. Yes, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. And so Kim, in Washington, the system works very well. It, uh, as you have noted, you know, produces uh, favorable outcomes for both parties, turnouts higher, uh, there is no fraud. Uh, it legitimizes the outcome. So from your perspective and thinking about, you know, what Bill just suggested, um, that this is really not a Democrat or Republican issue. Um, how are you looking at things in Washington state and what arguments might you make um, to federal legislators that, you know, not only is vote by mail a smart way to, to encourage more people to participate, it's a safe way, um, but that, you know, it, it doesn't benefit one party or another. Well, you know, I, I think first you, you have to look at the environment we're operating in in 2020 with, uh, you know, 
eight months ago, my biggest concern was cybersecurity. And that now is, is fourth or fifth, still an important priority, but it has been, you know, uh, surpassed by, um, you know, 16% of our population can't walk into a polling place. They're over 65 and they're a high risk group and they, they you know, to make it really dramatic, could, you know, put their life at risk to be able to exercise a constitutionally protected right. And that has a ripple effect across the board, even in a vote by mail state, because um, one, we do have a number of voters that need to come in person to cast a ballot, uh, get a replacement ballot, register to vote. Um, so all of us are wrestling with very similar um, themes. We just have different solutions based on the type of system we have. Um, what we're seeing in, in Washington state to exacerbate this is that same group is the, the majority of our poll workers in uh, in in person states, and it's our our back end workers processing our mail in ballots in vote by mail states. Um, we're looking at half to two thirds of our workforce will not be available for our August uh, primary and our November general. That is a huge problem. That's a real problem. It's not partisan. I need to be able to conduct an election that inspires confidence in all voters, whether you are a Democrat, Republican, progressive, Green Party, Libertarian, it doesn't matter. And that's what election officials right now are facing. And so you add this other layer of um, partisanship that you know somehow it, different voting methods are going to advantage one party or another, it's just muddying the waters. What we really need to do as a country is focus on solving this problem and get past that partisanship. And one of the ways we do that is, is take from the lessons of Washington state and the other four states that do vote by mail elections. Um, you have to balance out security and access. So if you are going to mail every voter a ballot, you have to have the compensating controls in place, like any business, like a bank, to, to inspire confidence. And um, you know some of the, the, com the, the comments that John was making get to the heart of that. How can I convince John that our election is secure? And Washington's experience, we had the closest governor's race in the country's history in 2004. And that was our last statewide polling place uh, general election. Um, it was not pleasant. It, it had a lot of the themes to be very bipartisan, very similar themes to 2000 presidential election. And I say that because we had problems at the polling places and with absentee voting. We had um, provisional ballots that should not have been counted that were included in the tally. We had absentee ballots that were misplaced because we didn't have good internal controls to know that 400 ballots were missing and were sitting on a shelf in a, in a stack of ballots, in a tray, I mean, that, um, that empty trays have been put on top of. Um, and so what Washington's experience since then has been and why we moved to vote by mail, quite honestly, is when you have a polling place environment and an absentee voting uh, uh, availability, you can't plan and you can't do both elections well. And that's what I think a lot of states are facing. It's what you're seeing in Wisconsin and Georgia and pick whatever state has had a primary recently it's difficult to be able to anticipate and plan when you don't know how many people are going to show up. And right now we don't know those answers. So, you know, what we need to do is come together as Americans and figure out how we're going to solve those problems, how we're going to make sure that every person that shows up at a polling place has a safe voting experience and expand the voting at home opportunities. Um, the, the other challenges, you know, besides the partisan stuff, do we have the capacity to print the envelopes to mail all those ballots? Do we have the capacity in the printing system to print the ballots? And I say that because you have the staggered primaries, so we have the capacity then, but in November, all of our cutoffs are almost the same. So we all have to print ballots. Each of the 50 states have to print ballots at the same time, print envelopes at the same time, have mailing houses to mail those ballots out. All of that is planning. And so right now we're losing, we're losing opportunity time because we're, we're arguing about the merits of something that I agree with Bill. Let's, let's have that debate next year when legislative sessions are, are reconvened. Right now, what we need to do is, is make sure we have the capacity and the security to answer those tough allegations of fraud. So when, when the White House says there's rampant fraud or when Congress says that there's rampant voter suppression, election administrators need to be the, the calming voice that, that can address both and can show the security and the access is there. And that's how we inspire confidence. So, okay, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> that's no, a no, case. No. Yep, no, th thank you, thank you. Um, so, Kim, when you, 
uh, when you think about sort of framing this debate and making an effective argument to those Republicans in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate, that are skeptical maybe of what you just said, mm -hmm. um, do you have some recommendations on languaging that might be used? Because, for instance, you know, we have found that when you say vote by mail to certain Senate offices, they kind of scoff and say, mm -hmm. well, you know, that sounds like a Democratic ploy. But if you say absentee balloting, uh, that somehow resonates with them and they can relate better to that. So any suggestions about framing these arguments? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I, I think that the distinction becomes an absentee ballot is something that the voter requests. Mm -hmm. they, they take an active role in either filling out an application or they, they contact their county official or their local official to get a ballot. Vote by mail is something that government says you're going to do. And I think that that's immediately where you get that visceral reaction from voters. And I say that having gone from a polling place state to an absentee state to a vote by mail state, um, you saw that as we started to ramp up vote by mail. And when we would do an election entirely by mail, you're, you're, you're causing me to have a poll tax with the stamp. You're causing me to have my letter carrier see my signature. Um, and you had to do things to mitigate that, like drop boxes. Um, people will drive 40 miles out of their way rather than put a stamp on an envelope. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's that balance. And I, say, I think what Congress needs to do is, first of all, let's stop using those terms. Let's just talk in terms of an option to vote at home. And I think the reality is when you have states that have only experienced five or six or, or less percent um, ballots returned by mail, they probably right now with the time left to the 100 days before our UOCAVA voters uh, need to get ballots, um, they may not have time to ramp up a full complete vote by mail system and do it with the security measures I'm talking about. And I think we have to accept that. So, so different states are going to have different options. California, it appears, is going to be able to ramp up complete vote by mail, and that's great. But you, you go further east, the, the states just don't have that capacity. So mm -hmm. how are you going to make the polling place safe? How are you going to make the voting at home experience safe? And let's focus our energies there. It's going to take money. We do need Congress's help. And I say that as a fiscal conservative uh, you know, leader mm -hmm. on the Republican side, we, we, we need that money so that states can actually do the things that are going to prevent what happened in Atlanta yesterday. Or, or Tuesday, I don't even know what day it is, Tuesday. Yeah. Um, you, you know, you have to have that capacity to deal with the crush of voters that are gonna show up on election day. Right. So let's, you know, let's get past the partisanship. And, and I think it's also, you know, I heard it in a couple of the comments already. We have to get it somewhere in the middle. It's not gonna be a complete universal vote by mail and it's not gonna be a complete polling place election. Let's mm -hmm. figure out what that middle ground looks like and dare I say, compromise in Congress, talk to each other, figure out how we can balance access and security, and let's get this election run. Because right now, both sides believe they're gonna, they're win, they're gonna win, and they can't even comprehend that the other side could. And we right. have to convince, we have to convince the losers that, uh, that the election was mm -hmm. fair and mm -hmm. accurate. Right. That's, right. that's really the bottom line. Right. Kim, just one last uh, thought, and to put a fine point on this, this distinction you make about absentee balloting that the voter has to take initiative, whereas vote by mail is sort of the government is doing this for you. So the reason I, I, I want to just dig into that a little bit is, you know, we hear from many progressives that they think, you know, everyone should vote, and actually government should be encouraging everyone to vote and make it very easy, and everyone's post-it should be paid as well. So to reflect that view um, and from a conservative position to maybe educate our progressive colleagues, what would you advise them to consider as, you know, as, as they work on this issue and maybe realizing they're not going to get all of what they want either? Yeah, I, I think it's, again, the Washington experience is, is a good model because um, we definitely have that dynamic here in Washington state. So if you're going to talk about mailing every single voter a ballot, then you have to have a control like comparing the signature on file to ensure what, what John was talking about, you know, these millions of ballots that are just sitting out there, whatever comes back, I can actually with a high confidence level show you that um, Bill Crystal's signature matches the one on file. And he, he, when he registered to vote, he had to prove, uh, had to show ID. So one of the things that gets left out a lot of times in my state is that we've had voter ID since 2006. 
Most people don't even think about that. So our voters have to show one of three forms of ID and, and the vast majority of them, 98% do. The remaining 2%, we have an alternative ID. And that's been challenged in court by the Brennan Center and the, the court upheld it. And I, I say all of this because you have to be able to address the access arguments and the, the security arguments that both sides make. Both mm -hmm. sides are okay. gonna use voter fraud and suppression. Right. So address them. Right, okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, Mindy, um, thanks for joining us. And, and Mindy Finn is with uh, an organization called Stand Up uh, Republic. Uh, she's one of the co-founders. And uh, they're working on cross-partisan election reform, looking at security and the integrity of our election. Um, and Mindy, I wonder if from your perspective, um, you could give us some insight into two things. One, I, I know you have chapters across the United States and are in the process of mobilizing lots of citizens to weigh in on these issues. And secondly, I know you've been thinking a lot about sort of the uh, legitimacy of this election and um, wondering about how to, in, um, how to produce, how to have a result that people can trust. So when you think about vote by mail, how does it relate both to you know, wide scale participation and uh, a result that we can trust? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for, for having me. This is an issue we've been working on kind of in a, in a number of ways. Um, to respond to your question, you know, first of all, I just want to say that I agree with the, the points about this being an American issue and not so much a partisan issue. And you know, the president and others who have sought to, to polarize it, I really, that's a distraction. And, and the fraud um, issue is, is pretty much a, a straw man. I mean, fraud, fraud, the fraud concerns and even instances of fraud have been part of our democracy from you know, the beginning of, of the founding of, of the country. But you know, in, in recent history, even the president's own election commission to study fraud after 2016 was disbanded after not really finding evidence of it. And the Heritage Foundation conservative think tank who studied this um, also could find very few instances. Um, in, the, in the instances where there has been fraud, um, you know, those obviously do need to be addressed. But if you kind of dig into them, in those cases, it's often the case that there's, it's not voters that are committing fraud. It is bad actors that are looking to kind of manipulate voters. Um, so people who are offering to take people's ballots and turn them in for them, which is kind of what happened in North Carolina. Um, recently, and then it was actually a Republican operative that <laughs> that was doing that on behalf of a Republican candidate, um, just to sort of talk about the, the nonpartisan you know, nature of this. And this is not an issue of Democrats committing fraud. Fraud can happen on both sides. It happens you know, very infrequently, but even the most uh, famous ex recent example kind of happened with a, a Republican operative that was engaged in fraud for, you know, for on behalf of a Republican candidate. And even in those cases, you know, it, that really speaks to making it as convenient for the voter as you possibly can. Because if you're making it convenient for the voter, such as sending them, um, you know, an absentee ballot application that does have a stamp on it, they don't have to get someone else involved. You have more online options, they don't have to get someone else involved, drop off locations. So just, I think it's worth saying that the, the fraud issue is, is really a strong man argument and those seeking to polarize this issue, um, it, that's really a distraction. When we're looking at, you know, to, to um, Kim's point, this is just something that needs to get fixed. And Republicans, Democrats, independents across, you know, across parties believe this is an issue that needs to get fixed. And if we're looking to fix an issue, I'd say go to the people who are closest to the issue. Obviously, secretaries of state and election administrators. And when we get down into the state level, there are many, um, there are secretaries of state Republicans and Democrats who are working very hard to be prepared for, one, for running an efficient, effective and safe election. You also go to the voters. And this has been an issue that has been polled now quite a bit. I personally have, have done a poll just in Ohio um, in the wake of their primary, which kind of happened right amid the COVID shutdown. Um, and 79, you know, some polls it ranges, but, but it's usually between 72% and 79% of American voters nationally and even on a, pretty even across states when you pull individual states, um, believe that we should have the option, that all voters should have the option to vote by mail 
or at least by absentee, or they can request an absentee ballot, in, at least in this election. The numbers decline if you talk about making it permanent past this election, but in, amid COVID concerns and amid social distancing, you know, a strong majority of voters, anywhere between 72 and 79 percent, say that uh, they should be able to vote, you know, vote at home or, or request an absentee ballot. A slight, you know, there's slightly bit more support for absentee ballots. The, you know, there is some partisan division on that. Among Republicans, it's usually around 60 percent, um, 60 to 65 percent, but that's still a strong majority of Republicans who are embracing vote by mail or absentee balloting, you know, am amid this pandemic. I think the question has been asked a couple times of how do you make the case? So whether it's people, you know, activists that are making the case um, to their uh, legislators in the states or at the federal level, to me that's, that's the most compelling case, which is that this is at a time when we are deeply polarized on many issues, there is incredible unity around this issue with a strong majority of Americans across party embracing vote by mail and absentee voting and or absentee voting, depending on what the rules are in the states, um, you know, this, this election. I think it's also important to make the point, because um, a lot of people don't understand this, is that even prior to this election, 29 states allowed for no excuse absentee voting. So essentially, they could request an absentee ballot with COVID being an excuse or, you know, their discomfort or, you know, feeling that they're, they're immune compromised, whatever the excuse may be prior to this. More states are updating their laws, obviously, in the wake of COVID. And those that aren't, um, you know, those are the ones to really focus on. So you look at a state like Texas, for example, who ruled that for even for those over, over 60 that are within the kind of vulnerable population window, that they can't use COVID as an excuse to request an absentee ballot, but they're expanding early voting locations. So at least they're, they're doing that. Um, I, I think the main kind of, and I'll close on, on this point, is that um, the, dis the national conversation on this really is a distraction. The states are the uh, laboratories for democracy. I personally am, am a fan of and an advocate for more expanded vote by mail purely because for the states that have adopted it, they haven't seen instances of fraud. Voters really like it. It's, you know, it's popular across party. It actually, it seems to have saved money. Um, I think it's, it's kind of adapting more to our times. It's weird to say that allowing people to vote by mail um, is, is actually an innovation and in progress. Uh, but at a time when our lives are, are very different, kind of in the schedules that we keep, it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and as, as Kim said, it also just is much more efficient and really cuts down actually on questions of integrity because it simplifies the process as opposed to having multiple ways that you know, people are receiving ballots and, and can vote. Mm -hmm. That said, this isn't really the time for that advocacy. You know, states do run their own elections and some are gonna you know, go to sending every voter a ballot with a stamp and some are gonna move to sending absentee ballot applications. But at a minimum, every state should be in a place where every, every single voter by the November election has the ability, has the choice to vote without showing up in person and putting themselves at risk or in danger on election day. And in particular, not just for their own safety, but because we, don't, we won't have the capacity to serve voters, just like we saw in Georgia in a primary election with a much smaller um, voter turnout you know, than what we will see in November, where there, there's not going to be as many polling locations. We know that there may not be as many provisional ballots, and there's, we're going to struggle to get poll workers who can actually work you know, in-person voting location. So I think the goal really needs to be for every state to, at minimum, be giving voters, um, you know, sending, I, sending voters an absentee ballot application and for every voter to have the choice and for it to be easy for them to vote that way come November. Mindy, thank you. And I just wanted to pick up on one point you make, um, and Kim, you might want to weigh in on this as well, is, you know, while Congress debates the possible uh, authorization of another $3.6 billion, many states, state legislatures and governors and secretaries of states are deep in debate about uh, how to reform the rules that govern how their elections are being conducted. So yesterday, the Iowa state legislature took some action. Uh, in Florida, Governor DeSantis is looking at some changes. Ohio, same thing. So there's an active conversation in many states 
about the possible expansion of vote by mail and the conditions by which um, people can participate. So Mindy, are, is stand up, re, stand up Republic working in any particular state? And what, um, what advice do you have for organizations wanting to help shift the debate uh, in a state by state case? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we are working in, in a number of states, but I think the most effective thing that we've seen because time is really short right now mm -hmm. and are the tools at our disposal to influence legislators um, are actually are much kind of limited in scope in the wake of COVID just by the nature of how people are working. I mean, there's opportunities as well, but, but they're somewhat limited. Um, and it really is um, the, the relationships, those who have the relationships with legislators in the states that need to pass legislation to allow for, um, like in the case of Wisconsin, you know, to, to send everybody an absentee ballot application, to, to be heavily lobbying those legislators, find champions um, in the state legislature who can carry this forward, working obviously with the advice of the Secretary of State. Um, and, and this is happening. So, you know, Ohio is an example, the Secretary of State there, Frank LaRose, you know, is an advocate for, or would have been an advocate for sending everybody a ballot, certainly sending everybody an absentee ballot um, application. The legislature hasn't been quite where he is, but he's been able to, you know, through his advice and, and advocacy, move them closer to his position. Wisconsin, um, on a bar bipartisan basis, um, with, you know, Republicans and Democrats working together, passed a bill to send everybody an absentee ballot application. And, you know, that was just based on the work of the last couple months once they saw how much of a disaster their election you know could be um so that i mean it's it's really going to be it's really kind of person to person shoe leather right, right. Um, okay. the effect of shoe leather of those who have relationships with those so that's i mean that what we tend to do is former state legislators um that are, are kind of our state leaders so in arkansas is is for example ohio um, is really empower them with the talking points and the information and then have them be talking to, you know, those legislators in real time because this is, this is an urgent, this is an urgent issue. I mean, the window, as I think Kim said, just because of, of having, building up the capacity and the resources that will be necessary to run a, um, an effective and, and election that right. people can trust and have confidence in in November, the window is really the next couple months. Yep. Yep, good. Let me let me ask uh, the panelists and anyone weigh in on this uh, about another urgent uh, concern, which is the fate of the U.S. postal s uh, system. And w one of our colleagues on the phone has asked about that. And you know what will happen uh, to the postal system uh, and their ability to process, you know, what will be an unprecedented increase in the number of, of ballots sent through the the mail. Um, anyone have a, a thought about that? Okay, I'll weigh in since I might have a little bit of experience. Um, I think the capacity of the existing system is there for the USPS. Quite honestly, um, we're kind of like, you know, get off me flea. We, you're, you're, you're high volume for you, but for us, it, it's really small. Um, but if, if they can't continue to serve at the level that they're serving, if they run out of money, we are in a very, very um, crisis mode across the country. Um, and the biggest reason is they can, the USPS delivers to everyone, regardless of whether you live in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a state, on a rural road, or if you're in an urban center. Um, they have to by law. And if that goes away, now we have to depend on, you know, the private carriers, UPS, FedEx, and they don't have to do that. They aren't mandated. And so just out of the gate, you're already talking about not reaching everyone. So um, we're, we're definitely working uh, to try to support the USPS funding and um, it, it needs to happen. And if it doesn't, um, I'm very worried about what happens in November. One more thing to add to that list. <laughs> right, right, one more thing, yeah. Yep. Um, Bill, let me ask you a question someone's posed here about, you know, how, um, how to prepare the American public for the possibility that we might not know uh, who's won the presidential election on November 3rd and it may carry on for a few days, which, as you suggested, will stir up all kinds of consternation. So any, any recommendations on what uh, business groups might be doing now to prepare for that possibility? I think mostly educating people that this could happen. It's a totally normal thing that happens. Uh, we're used to it all other walks of life, not having 
instant knowledge on the, the night of something of an election, even you know, think of our own just community kind of affairs and so forth about what might have happened. And, and we need to, so people need to be calm. Uh, they need to resist demagoguery. I think business groups can weigh in with other businesses that will have a real effect on this. Media companies, for example, they're, they're business groups. Uh, very important for them to be responsible on election night and even go ahead of, I'd say go out of their way ahead of time to educate people that it may be the case that X percentage of votes won't be counted till after election day. And there are also ways in which states can, of course, and Kim knows much more about this than I do, adjust their deadlines and adjust their resource efforts to try to get some more stuff counted on election day, even if it is a little more difficult than taking a week. But, but uh, and then the, look, if, 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 pe if people demagogue it, there needs to be an effort by leaders of all sorts. And I think here the business community could be very helpful to say, wait, to say ahead of time, don't demagogue it. And if there is actual demagoguery, let's say on election night at 10 p.m., very important that senior people from all walks of life, and this would include, you know, George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and it would include uh, retired uh, other, you know, governors and, and current governors, actually more importantly even, it would include uh, respected business leaders from different areas saying this is not something to, this is the last time thing we need to have demagogic statements about and appeals to mobs to show up in Washington or in state capitals, which could happen, of course, right? Uh, we have tiny, tiny versions of this in 2000 that I will tame mm -hmm. in retrospect, I think, um, in Florida. Uh, so I think, you know, it's very important for people to get the alarm out earlier on this. I think it can't just be suddenly on election night, people looking up and saying, well, what's going on? Maybe. Trump, to be honest, it's going to be Trump, you know, is right that, that something's being stolen here. Uh, the, the governors are extremely important on this and getting them on record ahead of time, especially in some obvious states that could be close. And frankly, especially Republican governors, who I think will be more tempted to go along with Trump if he call, tries to cause trouble, uh, getting them on record ahead of time that we are, have confidence in our state system. I mean, how can a governor say ahead of an election that he doesn't, he hasn't done everything he can to try to have a safe and secure election in that state? It's right. sort of irresponsible for a governor to, to say, to acknowledge that. So presumably they have an interest in assuring everyone that it's going to go well and that people should keep calm. And if there are some minor controversies, as there often are, uh, they'll be worked out in the way that election, uh, elections have been worked out in the past. So I think it's getting people on record early is really important on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Could I put a finer point on that um, from my perspective? Uh, Washington State has a postmark. So if, if ballots uh, have a postmark of election day or before, they are, are considered uh, el eligible to be counted. Half of our ballots come in election week. Half of our ballots. This is a trend you are going to see nationwide. I will make this prediction as we sit here right now. Large numbers of ballots will come in election day, and depending on the laws in each state, those ballots will be able to be counted even after election day. We will not know the president potentially for weeks, not days, weeks. I'm saying this right now while everybody's calm and objective. That is definitely one of the messages we have to be getting out of, across um, and starting to set up the expectations for because it's going to take time to process the volume of uh, ballots that are going to come in by mail. And this is a fact. This is I'm basing this on years of experience. And I, I think that's one of the things I'm most worried about, too, is exactly that. When, when you still have half of your ballots left to count after election night, people are going to say, oh, they're ballot box stuffing. They're doing this. That. No, they're actually just doing their job. Mm -hmm. um, so you, Bill's absolutely right. We, we, we need to get leaders across the country in all, um, in all fronts, uh, business, nonprofit, leadership, and government, and saying, we're not going to probably know who the president is until late November. Okay, good. W w um, I wanted to turn to Sarah Bonk for a moment. Um, and so we, um, Business for America has been working on an initiative called Operation Vote Safe, which is designed to help election officials uh, run these safe, secure, and credible elections. Um, so Bonk, you want to describe that a little bit? Sure. So actually, this is an idea that came up through an earlier conversation with Secretary Wyman. Um, we recognize that the, the shortage of resources at the state level, she was alluding to, even in a vote by mail state, there's a, 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 a staffing shortage. Um, so how can we deploy the business community to help out? And so what we want to do is mobilize businesses that are civic minded and recognize the need to provide direct support to the states, to the local officials trying to run these elections. And that support can take several forms. First of all, 
Just like you might have a beach cleanup day, there can be a help run your democracy day, um, becoming a poll worker, helping with ballot counting operations, and other needs that the states may have. Uh, second of all, it can involve supplies. We actually already have a couple companies that are interested in providing PPE and um, hand sanitizer for polling locations and, and for poll workers and other ways of con kind of consumable supplies that, um, that might be available. Another one actually is facilities. So a number of states have been holding their uh, elections in nursing homes and schools and churches. And we need to get those to areas where social distancing is possible and they're not putting anybody at risk. So some businesses certainly have space. Maybe that is an empty hotel ballroom. Since there are fewer events, maybe it is an empty warehouse. But whatever it takes to help find some locations where in-person polling remains necessary to help that be safe. And so we're organizing and mobilizing these businesses and we want to match make between states that have needs and those businesses that have the ability to provide support. So you can certainly reach out to us. I would say the website is bfa.us. There's all kinds of ways to contact us. So just reach out if you wanna know more. Right, and if your company wishes to participate. Um, so we just have a few minutes left, but uh, Kim, there's a, uh, two questions that I think you can answer. The first is, how do you keep your voter rolls clean and up to date? And then the second part of that question um, is about whether there's a role for the secretaries of state from the five states that have uh, the system designed to entirely vote by mail, whether you five, the Republicans and Democrats, can weigh in and try to convince Congress to allocate these fundings. Easier said than done. But the first question is about keeping voter rolls clean. The second is, you know, how to maybe mobilize uh, the states that already have this system in place. Well, it, th this is going to be another one of those big, big heavy lifts for poll site states. Um, in Washington, every year we have a general election. So every uh, one of our 4.5 million registered voters receives a ballot and we're getting updated information on their addresses from the post office. Uh, we have an, another whole tier of, um, we're a member of the Electronic Registration Information Center or ERIC. Uh, this is a consortium of 30 states that do data matching like the, uh, the um, uh, what do I say? The, what your sector does, uh, what commercial data has been doing for 40 years. Um, we're using that technology to compare <laughs> data, update uh, when a voter moves from Washington to Colorado, uh, being able to have election officials reach out to them and, and clarify where their registration should be. Um, all of those things keeps our list more current and uh, up to date. And we are also comparing to the Social Security Death Index to remove voters who have, have uh, died and make sure that they're not on the rolls. Uh, so we do a lot of things list maintenance wise um, constantly in our state to keep that list up to date. Um, that's my worry with some of these states that don't have that same ability uh, because they're going to have old addresses. And I think, again, to be proactive, what the business community can help us with is remind people right now to update your registration. Everybody thinks about registration. They don't think about the fact that they've moved since the last time they voted. They got married and they changed their name. All of those things, you know, do it proactively. Right now, go to your, your uh, county or your local election official's office and see what is on file for you and make sure it's up to date. Um, I think that, yes, absolutely, the, the five of us uh, states that are vote by mail need to be reaching out proactively to our, our congressional delegations and more importantly, leadership in the House and Senate, um, especially, you know, in, in the cases of those of us who are elected partisanly, you know, I should be re reaching out and, and I have been to, uh, to my Republican mm -hmm. counterparts in Congress and letting them know, here's what you should be factoring in and, uh, and Democrats should be doing the same with their side of the aisle and again, so we can get to some sort of um, middle ground. Right. Good, thank you. <clears throat> well, it is top of the hour, so I, I wanted to thank all our panelists for their insights and uh, welcome the participants on this call to contact Business for America. And let me uh, finally just turn it back over to Sarah Bonk to maybe review uh, quickly what uh, some of the key takeaways are. Thank you, Richard. And thanks again to our panelists and thanks to our partner organizations for helping to promote this. I could go on about a lot of reflections of what we heard today, but I'll distill it down to, I think, the key point, which is, as we said at the top, this, is, this ought not be a partisan issue right, that this is an American issue and that we have the solutions already to run elections in a way that are safe and secure and accessible 
and accurate and that we can have confidence in those elections. But what we need to do right now is marshal the resources. We need to put the pressure on Congress to get those funds in place and do everything that we can to support the states in getting this done. So for those of you out there that are in the business community, I know some of you have joined us today. Um, thanks to those of you who are already supporting us. And the rest of you, we'd invite you to sign our letter and get, uh, get involved in our Operation Vote Safe. Um, we wanna help make things run as smoothly as possible uh, this this fall and help build trust in elections again. So thanks again to everybody for joining us.